please help me welcome Fazia Khan. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to everybody for coming out here. And uh, I just have to say I'm so happy because today is my two-week anniversary of my second shot. Yes. So, awesome. Yay. Fantastic. Um, in the run-up to this uh, uh, event, and the show, too, um, I was reflecting on uh, how long I've known you. We met through the center, and I think it was 14 years ago, um, 14, 15. Um, and during that span of time, every time our paths cross, you're working in a new medium. <laughs> when, when I met you, you were working in bronze, mm -hmm. cast bronze, mm -hmm. um, and then you were out to the state fair uh, as a studio here artist. I think the, the first year, and you were knitting mm -hmm. at that time. And then I ran into you out at uh, the Minnetonka Art Center. We'll give them a plug, even yep. though we're here. Mm -hmm. And you were weaving over there. Weren't you weaving? No, I was stone carving there. Well, see, I, I can't. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, I was. I, yeah, I, I wasn't, I I wasn't going to be rude and call both. you out on it. I was just going to let it ride. You're right, you're right. Uh, so how, um, how do you choose a medium? What, what drives that, um, that pursuit, that, that chase? So James was talking about how he gets bored after doing something for a while, and I'm the same way. I think I have ADD that way. I just, I just like to learn new processes. Uh, it engages my brain, and if I do something too much after a while, I just think, oh, God, I'm done with that. And I need to learn something new, I need to do something new. And that gives me the ability then to pluck from my repertoire whatever I need to get my idea across because most of my work is based on concept, um, based on an idea. Um, we have some slides of previous work, and I wondered if you'd care to tour through some of that with us. Okay, we'll go through them kinda quickly. Let me stand up so I can see. So this is something I made when I uh, first started. And I'll, I'll just, can I briefly say a little something about me? Please. So I, um, I came to art as a second career. Originally, I trained as a physician. I was an OBGYN. And after I gave birth, I decided to take some time off, and I never went back. <laughs> so I was done with that phase of my life <laughs> and moved on to being a stay-at-home mom. And then after some time, I thought, oh, no. Now I've, I've got to go back to school and do something else. And um, I had gone for career counseling, and they said to me, they gave me one of those strong inventory tests, and they said, okay, you are equally divided between creative and structured, and they are on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you're ideally suited to either um, do something like graphic design or design greeting cards, something that's art creative within a structured um, environment, or be uh, an arts administrator, so a structured job in a creative environment. Um, but anyway, we ended up leaving Seattle and moving to Fargo-Moorhead, and I went back to school at MSUM thinking maybe I would do graphic design. And uh, it became clear to me after taking some classes that that was not what I wanted to do. What I really, really enjoyed, which was a total surprise to me, was sculpture. And I realized that I really did have a very three-dimensional brain, um, which shouldn't be a surprise because I was a surgeon, right? So I had to know that three-dimensional anatomy. So while I was in school at MSUM, I made this. This is called Desire or Destiny? Question mark. And it's about 10 inches tall. And this was from my first uh, life sculpture class that I took. And she happens to actually be the sister of a friend of mine who was at school with me. Um, and uh, the question mark is because we only had one child because we had fertility issues after that. 
and I looked at a lot of young women who were getting pregnant, like it, you know, somebody looked at them and they got pregnant. And I thought, how many people get pregnant and they're not so thrilled about it? And then there are other people who just would give anything to have another child and can't. So that's kind of where that came from. Then uh, when I left, uh, we left Moorhead and moved to the Twin Cities. And so I finished my degree at the U. Um, I got a BFA in sculpture, and this is a piece I made there. And you'll remember, of course, the war with, uh, in the Middle East, with, and then the war in Afghanistan and so forth. And so the plight of Afghani women was really on my mind. Um, I grew up Muslim. I'm from Pakistan originally. My parents were quite liberal, however. And um, my mom had to wear a burqa growing up because her family was pretty conservative. And when she married my dad, he said, you know, if you want to go on wearing that, it's okay with me. And she said, don't you ever tell my father that because I'm done with this thing. So, <laughs> and you know, this is kind of how she felt. So this is also about 10 inches tall. It's made of bronze and then those are steel um, rods that go through there. And then I don't know if you can tell from this slide, but the interior is quite, um, it has this kind of texture to it with some red and gold in there. So it's, it's about what's on the inside being way more beautiful than what you see on the outside. Uh, I think at the time I was looking at uh, churches in Ravenna in Italy from the fourth century, you know, where they're just plain brick on the outside and then there's this, all this gorgeous mosaic work on the inside. Ah, back to Moorhead. <laughs> um, this piece is called Regeneration. So after I gave birth, I noticed as my child got older, how some of the habits that they showed were like my mother, but they'd skipped me. And I thought, how did that happen? How could it have gone through me, not affected me, and come out in my child? And so this piece is um, sort of emblematic of that, and it's a, um, it's, it's a bronze, it's life size, and this is kind of an amorphous figure. This is my face, and this is my mother's face. And this, the eyes are actually open here, and I have some silicone eyes that I put in the back. So she really is looking at the one she's just taken off. So it's sort of like the genetic pool continues and the faces just keep changing. And then I made this piece uh, here at the U. This is cast iron. It is about so big. And I made it for a show in Moorhead. The theme was um, James Joyce, 100 years. And so these are, whoops, wrong button. <laughs> snakes. Um, you know how everyone says St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland, but there weren't really any snakes in Ireland. Um, but these snakes are inscribed with the uh, uh, letters of the Irish paramilitary groups that were involved in the conflict with Northern Ireland. And each snake is grabbing another one by the tail. So they're all connected. And in the center is this glass egg, cast glass, um, which represents this very fragile seed of possible peace. And so the idea was that if you disregard or remove any of these snakes from the equation, the whole thing falls apart. So they, they all have to be in this kind of precarious balance. This was a fun piece that I made when I was at the U. Um, this was my first collaborative piece. It's called Push Me, Pull You from Dr. Doolittle, if anybody remembers that. Uh, we had a, a class on kinetic sculpture, and so our final project was to create these art cars that we could then actually ride in and drive and have a race. And so uh, I was paired with another woman, and we were talking about how we were different because she, she's actually up in Duluth now, but she um, you know, was kind of your tip, typical Minnesotan, and um, here I am from, from an eastern country, and. Uh, so we talked about what we could do. So this push me, pull you is designed 
This is the, oh, I did it again, wrong button. Okay, that's the front and that's the back. The steering is in front. We designed this so that the brakes are in the back. We sat in the middle with me facing forward and she was facing backwards and went down this big hill. <laughs> and she had to trust me to steer and I had to trust her to brake when I told her to. And so the idea was this is what it is like to collaborate with another artist. You really have to trust each other and there has to be some give and take. So, so we won most artistic for the award. Um, and then this installation is called Pearl. And for those of you who are, I, I'm a Unitarian Universalist now, and so one of the things we did at our church in Fargo-Moorhead was to share joys and concerns. The idea being that when you share your joy, you multiply it, and when you share your concern, you diminish your own. And so I made this piece that's interactive um, there are five oyster shells here, and these are 18 inches in length. And then there was um, this uh, wall piece, and the glass is inscribed. It says, to experience joy, one must know sorrow. It, um, to make a pearl, please share your joy or sorrow. And so people could come, and they could write on a little piece of pearlized paper with gold or silver ink, a joy or sorrow, and put it in the pearl, and then every day I would come, uh, in the oyster, and then every day I would come and make a pearl out of it. And again, the metaphor is oysters take a grain of sand that's an irritant, and they coat it, and it makes something beautiful that we then treasure. And then I also had a sound uh, component to this where you could hear what people had written, what other people had written when you walked up to it. Uh, I didn't put any pictures of this big bird brains show that I had here, which was an installation. I think I cast about 200 bronze birds for it, and they were in five different groupings. But this is what I've done with them since, <laughs> because um, that's a lot of bronze. <laughs> so now I, I, I mount them on pieces of driftwood and, and sell them that way. And this is the piece Jim was talking about that I was working on when I was at the state fair. Uh, this is called You Are What You Eat. And there's a lot of, been a lot of talk about plastic in the ocean, right? And the birds eat the plastic, um, the birds, the fish eat the plastic, and then we eat the fish. And so then we're ingesting that plastic with dioxin in it. Um, and the plastic is a microplastic because the plastic that goes into the um, ocean degrades and becomes smaller and smaller to the point where you can't, um, you can't just fish it out, but the fish eat it. So I knit fish out of plastic grocery bags. And then I, I used every part of the bag because I stuffed the fish with the rest of the bag to plump them up. So you can see there's Target bags in there. <laughs> and grocery bags, Lund's bags, newspaper bags. <laughs> so. so, um, my mother moved up here and uh, after retirement and I got very busy with some caretaking. So for a while I wasn't making a ton of art. And then I went back to Pakistan with her on a trip and I was so inspired by the artists there. Um, there's so many, there's a, there's a lot of textile art there, um, henna art, and it's all done by women, you know, who do these incredible designs and, and work. And so I was inspired when I came back and I said, well, I wanna start screen printing on textiles. And so I went over to the Casket Arts Building and joined a studio there and learned how to screen print on fabric and started doing some work, and this is one of the later ones that I did. It's just called Fern Triptych. Um, fun story about this design. I got a new pair of running shoes, and so I was doodling and you know playing, and so I didn't get like a nice piece of paper. I used the paper that came in the shoe box, and I drew this, <laughs> this fern design on it. And then after I did it, I thought, that's really nice. Now how am I gonna use that? <laughs> And so I ended up 
uh, going over to a friend's place who had a big scanner and they scanned the whole thing for me and then I had it as a digital file and I could print it out to use on a screen. And after I did this, uh, the first time I did it, I did just one, uh, one section. Um, and then I decided to do a, a triptych like this. And I thought it looked very flat. Uh, so I decided to add some more color and texture by hand embroidering you know, some of these flowers in here. And some French knot work. So there's a close up. Oh, here's me screen printing. So this is the process. So you'll note the large white panels that are in the other room. This is me printing one of those. Um, so the fabric's on the table there. And uh, I've made the screen, and you can see it's got some words on it. And this is from the last one, I think. And then um, my friend and I built this table for our studio at Casket Arts. It's a fabric printing table, so it's got layers. Because printing on fabric is different from printing on paper. You need kind of a soft surface, because the fabric really takes up a lot of ink. And then you pull. So this first uh, pull was actually just to get the ink spread out over all the holes. And then this one is actually driving the ink through onto the fabric. Then I do another light pull to kind of put ink in again. And, and then pull. And most fabrics, you know, two pulls is enough. On paper, you only do one. Uh, with the white ink, you kind of have to do three because it's really thick. So. Did you add the other one, too? Yeah. Okay. You could have added it. <laughs> so I'm like, I hope it came out because <laughs> that's a big piece of fabric. So those of you who've been in the gallery have seen this piece. Um, this was a the first one that I, I was test printing before I made the final piece. So I had like three of these sheets. And um, uh, took it into the studio and put it over this figure, which was, uh, I think it was a mannequin that I bought because I was trying different figures underneath. And I quickly realized that that doesn't look very real. I can't use a mannequin. I'm going to have to make a body. So, so I did. But you, for, <laughs> not to be gross, but, um, you know, way too pointy in the upper part of the body. It's just not natural. <laughs> can't have that if you're an OBGYN. <laughs> so. This is the child of somebody in this room who, who very kindly volunteered to let me cast them. <laughs> so they're lying on a table in my studio. And another friend of mine, and who's back there, helped me cast Ray. So that, um, and it did take two of us. Good thing it was summer, because um, it's very cold when the plaster first goes on. And then it heats up as it's curing, so. So there that was. So that is the figure. Well, that is the mold. And then I, I put uh, paper mache layers into it to create the figure that's underneath that sheet. So newspaper and grocery bags and a lot of wallpaper paste. And then the face is actually a casting of my face that I, I had a mold of it. And so I put uh, paper mache in that as well. And that's what's on that piece. Should I keep going or? Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I thought I wouldn't know what to say when I got up here. <laughs> so the grant work, um, I was so lucky. I, I applied for a, a State Arts Board Artist Initiative grant for 2020 and, and I got it. And um, my, I wanted to interview women from around the state of Minnesota, just ordinary women who were really contributing to community in extraordinary ways, I think. And I think so often women are underappreciated 
like the, the value of their contributions because we, we do so many things apart from just working at a job. Uh, m women do the lion's share of childcare, uh, the lion's share of parent caregiving for your parents as they age. Um, they do a lot of volunteer work. Uh, and so that was my idea. And I interviewed 12 women um, from around the state. And because of the pandemic, I was gonna interview them in person and I couldn't do that. And so I interviewed them over Zoom and I ended up um, having to edit the video, so I had to learn Premiere Pro. Um, and I had no video experience, so I could really use James at that point. <laughs> but um, I put together the videos of the interviews, I wrote biographies on them, and then I created um, embroideries. Now, I have a machine that does embroidery, because if I had hand embroidered, I would never have finished. And I think that's a contemporary practice. You know, we don't always have to do things um, the way they were done 500 years ago. But the embroidery refers to that, that, that intensity of women's work and how laborious it is. And I embroidered their, their eyes onto dishcloths. I picked dishcloths because it's very domestic. And when I think of Minnesota, I don't know, I think of flower sack dishcloths because everybody who grew up here, um, you know, had that in their family. And, and it's a common thing that people know about. Um, what else do I want to say about that? The eyes, why just the eyes? So you remember the burqa piece that I showed you? Right. There are a lot of uh, countries where women who are Muslim cover themselves completely and show only their eyes. Or maybe not even that, there's a mesh that goes over their eyes. And that is not something that is religious. Um, that is cultural, it's a cultural practice. It's not written in the religion that you have to do that. Um, but it's become mangled and garbled. So I wanted to show just the eyes, kind of showing that anonymity and invisibility of women's contributions. And so I will tell you, this is my neighbor, one of my neighbors, Sharon Steinfeld. She is going to be 90 years old. She's lived in Minnesota her whole life. She's from St. Paul originally. And I put these in because I wanted to show you, it, it may seem like it's not that much work, to do one of these because I take the photo, I manipulate it in Photoshop, I adjust some colors maybe, and then I program the machine, and the machine has this photo stitch that it uh, creates that then um, stitches out. But it's not always accurate. So here's the image, and of course even on this projection the colors are slightly different. Here is what the machine gave me. And you can see the colors are wrong. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of green and gray in here. And this photo is actually more peaches and pinks. And so then I ended up just hand picking the colors and doing it over. And so I brought samples if people want to come up and look at them afterwards. And you can see how it's done because you can't touch the dish towels. That's that was, those are the images. Um, Fazia, on the the correct the color corrected one, did you create an entirely new piece, or did you layer embroidery on embroidery? No, no. you just have to start over. Yeah. We saw a lot of uh, process work and uh, heard about how the fern piece was originally drawn on the paper out of the shoebox. How often? Do you approach a project with a, a fully formed idea of what the final object is? And how much do you explore the concept through either drawings or study maquettes um, or writing it out? Uh, how much, how much yeah. of the preparatory work do you engage in, or is it mostly direct? I'd say it's 50-50. You know, I don't sketch. 
I know a lot of artists who sketch every day, and I don't do that. Um, I did make a maquette for the, um, the veil piece because I wanted to know how that would look. Um, what size was it? I mean, it seems so silly. So I have one of those little drawing figures that you can yeah. position, you know, and I just put it down the way I wanted it. I put a piece of fabric over it, and I think I put wallpaper paste or glue or something on there to get it to set up. Mm -hmm. And I liked the way it looked, and I thought, okay, so that's my form, but now I have to think about the surface and how I'm going to embellish that. And that piece in particular um, really engages the space around it as well. It's an installation piece. Mm -hmm. The works in your show are installation pieces. Um, how much does the, the content of the work change from venue to venue as you show that piece? if at all? It, it really doesn't. Yeah. How important is it that it gets the right space? That is important, I, I do, yeah. It, it's got to be, I, I think, so that piece has only been shown one other place in a show in Milwaukee, and I like it better in this space because it has its own space in this room. That was a group show, so that would have been hard to do. And it was difficult to control the lighting the way it's controlled here. I think here it's much more effective. Yeah. With your um, background as a doctor and um, leaving that career and coming to art as a second career, I think you said it that way. Mm -hmm. um, did you have interest in art before that time? Did, were, have you always been an artist? Were you making things as a kid? I did some drawing as a kid, but not really. I think my, my artistic or creative outlet as a kid was in the domestic arts. So my mom taught me how to embroider, how to sew, how to knit, because those were things that she did and everybody in her family, all the women did. And so, how to crochet. So I did those things, but no, I wasn't really what you would call artistic. What, what was the thing that said, boy, I'm going to do this? <laughs> I mean, how, you know, what, what happened there? You know, I think... I think it was a side of me that I never allowed myself to express because I thought I should pursue a profession, you know, a uh, respected profession, a lucrative profession. Um, my mom was a doctor and my dad was an engineer and it just, it wasn't, it's not something in Pakistani culture, like in Pakistani culture, you want your child to be a doctor or, or an engineer. Those are the two choices. Maybe an architect, but that's lower on the scale. Um, you know, you don't encourage your children to go into the arts because there's, there's no future in that. <laughs> so even though I think I'm a very creative person, um, and I, I have a lot of talents that way, it was never encouraged. Mm -hmm. So once I took the time off to stay home and be a mom, I started knitting again, I started doing other things, and I thought, well, first of all, my husband, bless him, gave me permission. He said, you don't, you don't have to go back to work if you don't want to, if it makes you miserable. <laughs> and I thought, well, I should explore what I can do. And so I think the career counseling was, was really helpful. And then just going in, I, I wanted to take a class at Moorhead State in graphic design to see if it was something I wanted to do. And the, the, uh, the head of the department was the head of graphic design as well, and he said, well, if you really want to get something out of this intro class, you, you need to take a year of drawing. You need to take a year of design. You just won't get as much out of it. And I thought, oh my God, I don't want to spend a year before I can even take this class to know if I'm going to like it. 
but I'm so glad that I did. I didn't think I could draw, and I'm not a very good drawer, <laughs> but uh, I learned that you can learn it, and, um, and then once I started taking the classes, I thought, this is fun, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. With becoming visible, what came first? Did, did you know, was it the idea that you would interview 12 women and interpret those interviews into objects? Or did you have, how did you arrive at, at that body of work? I knew I wanted to use the machine to embroider. And I knew that I wanted to be able to program the machine to embroider because when I did the veil piece, all those embroideries that are on there, I drew them on my iPad. I designed them. But then I had to send the file to this guy in Brazil to digitize them. And I sent it to Brazil because it was way cheaper than using somebody here in the Twin Cities. <laughs> and. Uh, and I thought, well, this is crazy because he doesn't really speak English. And you know, we had a few snafus, and then I'd have to try to get him on the phone and say, "Can you change this or that?" So I thought, no, I need to. If I'm going to use this, I need to know how to do it myself. And so that's why I wrote the grant, so that I could purchase the software, so that I could purchase the 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 um, laptop, and learn how to how to digitize myself. But then I also wanted to do a project about women and gender roles. And that came out of, um, I did the uh, summer intensive at St. Catherine University. They have a women's art institute there and they offer this summer intensive every summer. And it's four weeks, 16 women, uh, two professors and two TAs. And it's all day you have uh, seminar in the morning. Usually another woman artist will come in and present their work. Uh, we have uh, readings, poetry, other readings about women artists and, and um, how they fare, which is not as well as most male artists. Um, and then we go do studio visits and we're creating work and um, all that time, we're given assignments, and at the end of that four weeks, you have to have a piece ready to show. So that's where the idea came, and I was thinking, how am I gonna um, bring this idea of gender roles? Because for me, it's very personal, and that's something I learned at the Women's Art Institute. Uh, when I was struggling with what to make, and we had a critique with one of the professors and she looked at all the ideas that I had. I could do this, I could do that. And she said, just remember that the most powerful art is personal. It's when you're telling your story in some way. And so that's where the, the uh, coming over, overcoming came out of that. Um, so that's what prompted the wanting to make women's stories more visible because in my personal experience, I had one experience as a physician and a different experience as a stay-at-home mother. And I kept trying to justify that, oh yeah, I'm home, but I'm a doctor, you know? I, like I felt like I had to say that to people. <laughs> and they would say, you're a doctor, why are you at home? Why aren't you working, you know? So um, that's, that's an issue for a lot of women. The, um, the, the videos are, are um, revealing and um, incredibly vulnerable. And the idea of that is terrifying to me. Did you have to do some convincing? And how did you choose the individuals that you interviewed? Yeah, not everybody I asked said yes. I'll start with that. And I didn't pressure anybody because I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable. Um, I knew some of the women personally. I also looked at the women's press. If anybody's familiar with that, it's a publication that um, looks at you know women's contributions. And I talked to the editor. 
And she gave me some women who she thought would fit with what I was trying to do. Um, some of it was word of mouth. Like I was telling my friends about my project and they said, oh, well, I know somebody you should you know, talk to. Um, so that was how it came about. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that some of those women are here today. May I have them stand up and introduce them? Would that be all right? Absolutely. Yeah. So Ellie Krug. Um, Kate Tucker, Catherine Youngman, or Suzanne? Oh, Suzanne Wilhite. Did I did I miss anyone? Okay. So, yes. <laughs> they were very gracious and very generous to be that open and vulnerable with me, and uh, I really, really, truly appreciate that. But I, I do think that, you know, things are tough right now with, with the pandemic and with race relations. And I feel like the more you can share your own story, uh, the more people share their stories and peop other people listen to them. It gives you a better understanding of where people are coming from. And if you don't listen to other people's stories and you've made up your mind, you're not going to get anywhere. Related to um, the, the, the challenging year that you referred to, I know uh, another body of work in the show was done in response to that. Um, can you speak about how the project doing the digital drawings? Yeah. yeah. Um, so my grant period started May, March 1st. And luckily I had already purchased my um, was able to purchase at the beginning of March the, the software and the computer. And so I spent the first two months learning how to do what I needed to do. And then George Floyd happened. And of course, the pandemic and the lockdown was already in progress. And I was quite depressed and quite paralyzed and just couldn't, I couldn't think of starting on any kind of work. I just, I watched Netflix all day. I don't know how many of you did that. But uh, finally, I thought, okay, I got to get, get going on this because I have a year to finish this project and it's not going to get done. So um, there were a lot of challenges going around on Facebook and pretty much I thought, oh, I'm not doing that. This is silly. And then I decided to give myself my own challenge. And so I challenged myself to draw one mandala a day on my iPad using Procreate uh, with a stylus. <laughs> And, um, and put it on Instagram, because that would keep me honest. If I didn't post it, then you know I could just, after two days, say, no, I'm done. So I, I made an announcement that I was gonna do this on Instagram, and then I put one on every day. And it got to be so much fun. I was looking forward to drawing every day after the first few, and the people would give me feedback, and then I'd have to come up with how an idea on what am I going to draw today? What will it be related to? What colors am I going to use? And so the inspiration for those things came from my daily life during that month. I think I have one uh, piece there that was inspired by my socks. So I went running the day before, and I stepped on a lot of acorns, and that piece was inspired by the acorns. And then I washed my socks the next day with my red tablecloth, and they turned pink. And so those were the colors then of my socks for the next mandala. But it was, it was a lot of fun and I got a lot of feedback from people. So that was nice. And so the end of that month, I felt rejuvenated and I felt like, okay, now I can start work. What would you like to be known for as an artist? That I made people think. Think mission accomplished. 